It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Dayan Kohut, DDS. He goes by Dan. He earned his doctor of dental surgery from the University of Detroit Mercy School of Dentistry. He continued to complete a three-year surgical residency in periodontology at Nova Southeastern University College of Dental Medicine in Fort Lauderdale, where he was chief resident and recipient of the Fishman Award. This advanced training certified him to practice as a specialist in periodontics and implantology. Upon completion of specialty training, Dr. Kohut obtained diplomat status with the American Board of Periodontology. He has worked with over 300 offices since 2009. He helps general dentists get their offices to be specialists, ready to have specialist work there done. Also, he trains dental specialists who want to make a practice as an in-house specialist to be productive and very efficient. Dr. Kohut has been coaching other specialists interested in this mode of practice for years, as well as general dentists who are interested in expanding by bringing specialists into their office. My gosh, Dan, there's so much to talk about on this Monday morning, uh, the day before um, um, St. Patrick's Day tomorrow, and you've right. worked with so many offices. Um, what are you hearing about coronavirus, COVID-19 uh, in San Antonio? Honestly, I don't. Uh, I don't think the panic has really hit as hard here yet as it has in other parts of the country. But uh, I mean, it's just important to stick with the CDC guidelines and you know make sure you screen patients as they come and ask about travel, uh, recent travel, uh, take their temperatures, um, ask about any symptoms that they might have. You know, consistent with what we know. You know, with, with the coronavirus, such as a cough, fever. And uh, just take the normal precautions that we, as dentists, normally would, regardless, whenever we would see patients with uh, barriers and uh, everything consistent with what you're what you're going to be doing. Well, you know, um, you're um, you're only as strong as what you've ran into in the past, and we kind of dentistry went through this with HIV starting back in '89, universal precautions. Um, right. And we're healthcare providers. I mean, they're not going to shut down hospitals. Um, I, I I totally get it if it was um, talking about elective dentistry, cosmetic, bleaching, bonding veneers. But my gosh, when I was, you know I was talking to an oral surgeon yesterday because the uh, CDA uh, is recommending they close offices, and he's like, "Look, the majority of everything wow. he does is not elective." So right, what? Right. So what would you do if you were uh, a dental office and the dental associations were recommending that you close down? And you know. that's a very good question. I mean, I, I feel oral health is extremely important. I mean, we are still treating an infection, regardless. I mean, from my understanding, what I've heard through the news outlets is that it's a pretty specific subset of the population that is at risk. Uh, for for developing very very emergent uh, conditions with this, uh, the I guess congestive heart failure uh, patients, uh, patients with COPD, respiratory distress, are really the the ones uh, who are at, at most risk with this. Um, but it seems like children and most middle aged individuals uh, are not as as nearly affected by this from, from what I'm hearing. Uh, but obviously, you know, we're, we're getting more and more knowledge about this as, as each day and week progresses. Yes, I just, um, on Dental Town today, there was a, um, a dentist posting um, from Iran and he was saying how um, it's very bad. And he's saying that this is not like the flu. But if you right. were a dental office, um, I. Would you make a big difference between elective dentistry and staying open for emergency dentistry? I, I guess I would be a little more cautious as far as who I, I would treat as far as elective procedures. If it's a healthy individual who has not been traveling, not been in contact or, or going into these large public venues, uh, healthy I, I personally don't see why we would need to stop elective care. Uh, emergency care, I mean, for sure, we as healthcare providers need, need to need, need to do that for our patients. 
Uh, but as far as electives, yeah, it's a, it, it's a good question. It's, it, I mean, I'm hearing a lot of panic from a lot of my other colleagues, you know, who've been texting me the last two weeks, my phone has been blowing up, you know, asking the same question. And uh, it's, it's a good, it's, it's a good question. I mean, uh, what do you think about that? Well, what, um, so you say you would uh, screen patients. What exactly would you ask? Um, you said um, you would screen patients and ask about travel. Would that just be to China, South Korea, and Italy, the three major hotspots, or would you include uh, Seattle, Washington? I I would ask of, of any travel where where they've been. I mean, we know there are certain focal points in the country where uh, where we have these bigger outbreaks, uh, and and really ask them about any symptoms that they might have had in, in the last few weeks. Uh, biggest ones we know are, you know, fever, uh, cough, uh, that sort of thing. And I mean, for, from my standpoint, I, I'm most concerned about the elderly and the immunocompromised and, and the ones that have more respiratory issues. And, uh, you know, because of the ease of spread, of this virus. I mean, it is a concern, you know, but I mean, how far do you take this? I mean, do you, do you go and just completely shut down all offices and businesses? I mean, I just heard this morning that, uh, in New York, that, uh, that they were thinking of doing that completely shutting down small businesses. And I mean, that, that's going to wreak massive effects on, on the economy. Oh, and imagine a young dental student who's four hundred thousand right. dollars in student loans who just bought a uh, a practice for seven hundred and fifty or whatever. Um, well, let's say they didn't buy a practice and were just working at a DSO, paying down debt. The DSO, if demand contracted significantly, they would be unemployed, and um, you know they would be making right. their payments. This could be an economic disaster, as we've seen. The Dow just dropped another two thousand points I saw today. That. I'm, I I'm that, just yeah. so curious. Yeah. I think uh, Warren Buffett at the end of last year had 136 billion in cash. I wonder how much uh, candy he's already <laughs> bought um, um, in this economics of fear. But this is going to be devastating. So, um, what, what a lot of dentists have. Um, you said you've worked with 300 offices. When they say you say they've been blowing up your phone, what have they been calling and asking? What what are they sharing with you? They've been asking about what kind of precautions do they need to take. I mean, the ADA just released a statement not long ago, you know, as far as the precautions, uh, you know, disinfecting everything from door handles. I mean, everything you come in contact with, screening patients with by taking temperature, asking about travel, et cetera. You know, I mean, the, the guidelines are there. But I, I think it, it's more fear uh, f for them uh, of being told or, or commanded to shut down, or, or if, if this will actually, you know, come to come to Texas here as well, and uh, you know, it's like you just said, the economics of this are are huge. You know, I mean, I I just don't know if many offices can really even take that much of a hit with with overhead and all the other expenses. You know, the cost of doing business not getting any cheaper. Interesting times. When you, on dental school, I, I, when you go on dental school, when you go on Dental Town, I was just surprised. Like, um, um, almost every thread is about coronavirus. Number one, what defines an emergency? <laughs> Number two, coronavirus and patients. Uh, staff separation letter. Uh, California strongly recommends, recommends suspending dental care. Um, coronavirus. Who is no longer mm -hmm. working? Uh, shutting down. Um, how is your dental office can thrive during COVID nineteen? Uh, let's talk right. about two month right. contingency plans for COVID nineteen. I mean, it's just uh, it's just every threat. Anyone canceling trips because of coronavirus, uh, COVID nineteen era lease about to be signed, loan booked, location isn't my deal. What should I do? I mean, it's just it's um, it's just a full blown uh, panic mode. I think it started um, pretty much it on is. Friday. Um, so where do you as um, have you heard anything about the demand side of the equation? Uh, like my office is open today in Phoenix, Arizona, and the staff and the patients, uh, they everyone thinks everyone's overreacting and they're just, there it is the day before St. Patrick's Day and everybody's just, just going about their job. What, what are you hearing in Texas? 
I mean, for example, my week this week, I have I have probably about 10 offices that I have lined up this week, and I have a lot of surgeries on the schedule. Uh, I just heard today that one or two of them had canceled, uh, more out of fear than anything else, and had rescheduled for a month out. And uh, I think everyone just needs to stay calm and, and, and just take care of yourself as you would, just be a little more vigilant, uh, wash your hands more frequently. But I, I think the panic is, is somewhat getting out of hand. You think it's, you think it's getting out of hand. Um, do you, yeah, I mean, I, it, it's so tough because you look at like Italy and it, right. it just, it just blew up over there. Um, Iran, right. it just blew up over there. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it kind of landed first in a uh, Seattle here. That was kind of the first major mm-hmm. outbreak. Um, have you heard from any of your colleagues in Seattle? I have not. I have not from, from Seattle. Uh, I heard from a colleague in Ontario, Canada, and I heard from a colleague in New York, and uh, both of them are in full-blown panic mode, more so because of the question of how they're going to sustain themselves. Uh, Because in Ontario, the Ontario College of Dentists uh, apparently had uh, mandated that only emergency dental care be provided to patients. So he's worried, you know, financially how he's going to get through these next few weeks or if they close it for eight weeks. I mean, schools have completely shut down. I mean, where's the end? I mean, I don't I just don't see where the end in sight here is with with this. So your 10 cases that were um, scheduled this week, how would you define them as an emergency what is your definition of emergency i mean obviously when someone comes in uh with a swelling and infection and pain can't sleep or can't eat they're not going to be able to uh fight a virus or anything like that they need uh, extractions and root canals how do you define uh dental emergency of these 10 cases that you had scheduled this week how many of them would you define as an emergency or or emergency care or non non non-elective care the majority of my treatment uh, in, involves treating either periodontal disease or abscessed teeth with extractions and replacements such as implants. So obviously, implant therapy is not, by any stretch, an, uh, an emergency treatment. But uh, extractions definitely fall fall into that realm. And uh, periodontal disease is is a chronic disease, no doubt. Uh, but it's a big infection, and we know, you know, from a lot of literature out there that there are many systemic effects produced by it, and vice versa, with, with periodontal disease. So, uh, there was a spokesperson on a news outlet that I just watched uh, the other day, uh, where one of the people from the audience had asked this emergency room physician, "So, do we keep our dental visits as planned with this COVID-19 business?" And the emergency room physician stated, yes, oral health care is extremely important and keep your dental visits. So I, I thought that was a, a very good step for, for the world of dentistry. Now, as far as the what, what I qualify as an emergency to, to treat versus elective, uh, I mean, in, in my line, it, it really comes down to mostly implants, dental implants. And I, I would say if it comes down to that where it's mandated, then yes, I, I will postpone any kind of implant placements. This is, um, so what, what do you make of the uh, California's uh, um, decision um, to strongly, uh, California strongly recommends suspending dental care? What would, what would you, um, what was your response to that? I, I didn't see that myself, but I mean, wow, it's just, I, I can't imagine, you know, being a practitioner. I mean, just like, like I said, where's, where's the end in sight here? You know, what, how long is this going to take before, before this plateau drops and, and business goes back to usual or will it ever come back to usual again? And you know, going forward, I mean, this is, it says, this is uh, um, scary times. Oh, it's crazy times. Um, it says right here on their website, cda.org, as the facts and situation around COVID-19 continue to evolve, 
and in step with Governor New- um, Newsom's request declaration of state of emergency, including the call for all seniors over the age of 65 and residents with chronic conditions to self-isolate at home. The California Dental Association is requesting the copper- cooperation of California dentists and issuing the following guidance. The California Dental Association strongly recommends that dentists practicing in California voluntarily suspend non-essential or non-urgent care for the next 14 days. As always, it is expected that dentists will continue to be available as needed for emergency care and and services. Uh, The CDA does not make this request lightly, and it is being done out of an abundance of caution during this historic public health emergency. As healthcare professionals, um, we have a role to play in flattening the curve in order to sound scientific. So what, what do you make of all this? Um, what, would, what would you do if you lived in California right now? It's a very good question. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I don't. <laughs> I'm glad I'm in Texas and uh, we, we still haven't uh, received th- those kind of guidelines yet. I mean, I, I would just follow the CDC guidelines r- really uh, as far as how the recommendation is to, to treat patients and and protect yourself and the patients. I uh, I understand the the how infectious this disease is, and uh, it's a good question. It's a good question, and and many of us don't have the answers, and and so many are are just running to panic because of how ill prepared everyone really was for for anything like this to even happen um so what what are you gonna uh, plan for the rest of the week <laughs> well as of right now i have these surgeries on on the schedule but uh we'll see how things change i mean i'm sure that we'll be hearing something in our state over the next day or two uh, i'd be surprised if we don't uh but I mean, I'm going to continue business as usual as far as uh, treating patients that, that have abscesses and, and that need the disease controlled. Uh, but as far as elective procedures, if I feel that the individuals are, are more compromised health-wise, I, I will definitely postpone it. I would not want to put the patients at, at that risk. But you're not, uh, you're not feeling that right now? Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's uh, let's go back to our regular scheduled programming then. Uh, that was the C O V I D up, right? Um, so basically, um, this is there's so many um, questions regarding what you're doing. Um, you cannot be a jack of all trades. I mean, we know in 1900 there were no specialties, and healthcare was only one percent of the GDP. We know by 2000 there were 58 specialties with MDs, nine for dentistry, and it was 14 percent of the GDP. Now healthcare is 17 percent of the GDP. Um, there's a lot of dentists who think they're going to be a jack of all trades. They think they're going to master endo and perio and implants and silver diamine right. fluoride and veneers and occlusion, and, right. and they um they they just don't get it. So, um, you know, if something was wrong with my eye, I wouldn't even go to an ear, nose, and throat, let alone an oral surgeon. I would want to go to an ophthalmologist. And my ophthalmologist friends, they tell me that they don't even do retinas. There's other guys that just do retinas. And then when you talk to a retina guy, he only does one type of retina problems. And there's other guys that do other, you know, so it's so specialized. But then there's a big money's the answer. What's the question? Um, they, the insurance companies pay you more uh, than the general dentist. And when I talk to uh, DSOs, um, they're basically, now that they've had a run for a decade, they realize that you get a bunch of kids out of school that start doing molar endo and learning how to place implants. And then the, the, the employee turnover is very high with all millennials and any jobs. And so then they leave after a year. And over the next five years, you end up paying a periodontist to replace, you know, a half their implants and mul- and endodontist. And, and um, this is a huge economic disaster. And so, and then, so if the insurance companies are going to pay me, my office to have, if you come in as a periodontist, they're going to pay you higher fees. So we bring in more money. And then as us, we know that, 
you know, endodontists, when they do molar endo in five years, 5% are extracted, whereas general dentists is 10% extracted. So you're going to have a lot less warranty work. You're going to have, you know, it just totally makes sense that, um, that what we learned from Adam Smith's wealth of nation and specialization back in 1776, the wealth of nations that of course we're moving towards specialization. I mean, there's corn farmers who couldn't mm-hmm. tell you anything about growing wheat, uh, which is just right, as right. necessary. So, so due to specialization, due to the fact that there's 40,000 healthcare journals a month now in the United States and you can't have time to read them all. Um, The patient wants what's best. You want to treat other people like you want to be treated. I'd rather have someone who's placed a thousand implants place my implant. Then you have the rule of 52 that I'm I'm positive that if you don't do the procedure at least once a week, you're not faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost, and you're you're, you're wasting your time. So um, what is dentistry's future in your opinion of in-house specialists and do you think it's necessary do you think that's the direction it's going what's your take on it good question it's uh what i see based on the spread of offices that i've been to uh most of the offices i deal with are general dentists in private practice and many of them bicker and complain about the growth of corporate dentistry and they have a they find they have a much harder time competing with corporate dentists because or these corporate dental shops because they're one-stop shops so they offer everything in the way of ortho endo perio oral surgery everything under one roof and these private practice dentists uh, that have their own shops, you know, when, when they get patients come through their doors, you know, and they are not qualified or feel comfortable, I should say, uh, to treat these more advanced issues, they write a referral slip, call their specialist and refer the patients out. Well, we know from big businesses such as Amazon, for example, uh, who study customers like crazy uh, in terms of their habits and what gets them to buy, and, and they, they have figured out that uh, about this concept of reduced effort on behalf of the customer. You know, with this one one click shopping and uh, basically buying everything from the convenience of your own home. And these dental offices, I mean, how do they compete? You know, how do they position themselves uh, in a way? to sustain themselves, you know, with, with these one-stop shops, you know, having in-house specialists is an excellent way for these offices to provide more services and position themselves to be more competitive in their communities. And do you, do you see a difference in pay scales or are you, are you seeing that? As far as, as far as like, like, what would an insurance company pay you for a procedure and what would they pay a general dentist? Oh, big difference. Yes. Uh, reimbursement from dental insurance for specialist versus general dentist is huge difference for sure. For sure. Uh, my, my method, how I do it, for example, uh, I'm not in network with any plans. So I'm completely out of network fee for service at every office that I go to. Uh, the offices will, uh, basically fill out the form as a courtesy for the patients to get reimbursed and either get that sent directly to the office or to the patient, depending on the the arrangement and the assignment of benefits at how insurance works. So can you give, um, can you explain a lot of, lot of kids in dental school and even the first couple of uh, years out might not understand the in network, out of network. What, what, What does that actually mean for you? Can, can you be more specific on what that means? Sure. So to be a network to contract with insurance, uh, you're making a, an agreement with, with a certain plan that you will accept their fee schedule for these different procedures that, that you would do. Uh, depending on the different plans that, that exist, you know, some will cover that procedure at a higher percentage, lower percentage, or not, just depending on, on the individual benefits. But you're 
I personally find that you're shortchanging yourself by getting in that work as a specialist because of the lower fees. Dealing with insurance with being in network, because uh, I was in the past uh, in network with a few plans, uh, I was bombarded by narratives by insurance asking for x-rays all the time, even though they were sent. It, it seemed to me like a stall tactic more than anything else to delay payment from, from insurance. Uh, predeterminations, I mean, there's a whole, whole sleuth of, 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 of different uh, headaches that, that come with uh, being in network. Uh, whereas being out of network, you set your own fee schedule, you can still submit a claim on behalf of the patient and get them reimbursed for, for any treatment that you do if they have any insurance benefits. Most office, I would say most insurances uh, have benefits for out-of-network providers as well. I mean, they might not be as great, but they still have them as, uh, as for in-network providers. So now, do you do IV sedation? I was IV sedation certified. Uh, I stopped doing that, I want to say about a year, two years ago. Uh, more so just with my model, with, with the in-house traveling that, that I do to different offices, uh, I really want to keep it simple. So if I have any patients that need uh, sedation or conscious sedation or even deeper level sedation, I will consult with a dental anesthesiologist and have that service provided by them for the patients. I mean, I don't find too many that I need that, that way, but I, I find that just for the experience and, and for different uh, medical conditions that the patients will have, it'll just be a much better experience for them to do it that way. Now, you have um, a website. You have, it's called, um, well, you have your office. What's the difference between dental care of SA for San Antonio versus in-house, spe- in-house dental specialist.com? So, uh, dental care of San Antonio is one office that I go to. Oh, that's just okay. one of the offices of, of, how, one of, the offices. of how many Correct. offices Correct. do you go to? Ooh. On, on any monthly basis, I would say I probably touch about 20, 20 to 30 offices. 20 or 30 and offices a month. Somewhere 20. Yes. But the amount of time that I spend at each office in the frequency with which I, I go to each office is different depending on need and demand. Okay. Uh, there are some that I go every other week. There are some that I go to once a month. There are some that I go every three weeks. I mean, it just depends on need, the procedures that I do, how much follow-up care do I need for the, for the patient, like post-operative care, uh, that, that sort of thing. Now, are but, you doing the diagnosing and treatment planning bef- um, at a separate appointment? You know, do you, you know, do you see the patient yourself for the diagnosis and treatment plan, or do you go in there? Uh, obviously, you would, you would do that, not have the right, referring right. doctor. Right. Most of most of the time, what I will do is a separate consultation visit. I, I prefer that personally, just to build rapport with the patient, make them comfortable, answer questions, make sure that they are fully educated as far as the condition, what treatment options exist, etc. There are instances where it's more of an, I guess, quote unquote, emergency, where it'd be an extraction. And if, if possible, to do an immediate placement of an implant, you know, the, the general dentist will usually prep the patients for this before the patient would see me for a consult. And some patients I've been running into more and more have a hard time taking more time off to see me for a separate appointment uh, again, you know, to begin treatment. So. I'm, I'm seeing more and more patients asking for a consultation and possible same day treatment. So, but just to go back to your other question that, that you uh, asked previously, what are the difference between the two websites? So the other one, the in-house dental specialist is my consulting business that I had started uh, that teaches or, or helps general dentists in, in, uh, in terms of how to set themselves up to be specialist ready if they want to bring in dental specialists into their offices and 
training specialists uh, like Perio, OMS, Endo, who want to learn how to do this model in, in, a, in an efficient and productive format. Because the learning curve with this, it, it takes, it, it took me, I, I would say, one to two years before I, I really had figured out how to systematize this, uh, this model into a very productive format. And that's what I've attempted to package to teach others how to do this so they can hit the ground running quickly. So um, you've been doing this for my buddy, uh, Dr. Ricardo Ramirez in San Antonio, who I've met several times. Um, how, right. how long have you been doing it with Ricardo? Uh, I think it's going on three years with him. And how is, um, what is he like about it? What, what has been the challenges? You know, what, what have been the stresses you have to overcome? Good question. So most dentists, general dentists love this because not only it, it does it provide passive income for them, so that, that's uh, great for them. Uh, most patients like to stay in their home environment. Okay, so they, they prefer to stay here as opposed to being referred out. Now, the patients that have seen specialists before and have established a relationship with an outside specialist, by all means, keep, keep doing that. Uh, another value add for the general dentist, having a specialist in-house also, uh, is that the general dentist is in full purview of all the care that's being done and what needs to be done with the patient. So they see what, what's been done. Uh, they have a specialist right there who, who can offer suggestions, uh, potentially tweak, make any plans to the treatment plan uh, and, and that sort of thing. So it, it's ultimately it, it comes down to the ease for the patient and, and the convenience for the patient because I mean, in this uber convenience society that we live in, you know, I, I feel that uh, the model, the business models of dentistry are so outdated compared to most uh, big business today. I mean, big business is, is very innovative and disruptive. And I feel that many dentists still lag behind in, in that sense. And, you know, how do we make this easier on the patient in order to actually get the care? You know, we know for every, I mean, this is just an internal polling that I did uh, with, with a couple of the offices that, that I worked out of. Uh, for every 10 patients that would get referred out to a specialist, only half of them would actually end up making it. You know, the other half get lost in the system or just lose the referral, my dog ate it, whatever, you know, work gets in the life gets in the way and they never make it. Well, those are the ones that, that can be treated effectively by an in-house specialist because they don't have to leave. So you actually, you got, when you got out of school, you first started your own, or you bought a practice, right? Or, or... I was, I was working uh, in a corporate entity when I got out of school. Uh, and shortly after that, I worked for a period on us in Denver. And I was there for a good number of years. And, uh, and the ba biggest complaint that, that I heard from general dentists whenever I would go to market and, you know, shake the trees to try to get referrals, uh, I would hear from them, oh, this would be so much easier if you can just come in my office and do this. You know, why can't you come here? You know, the patients just don't want to leave. And, it, you know, it resonated with me. And, and that's what got me really thinking, you know, that there has to be a way to make a model out of this as a career, you know, with, with more and more of these younger specialists coming out of school with big debt, you know, it doesn't sound that attractive to them to, to now purchase a practice for another million dollars and take on more debt. You know, there's got to be a, another way or, or another option for them. And this is an excellent option because the overhead is extremely low. You don't have a bank loan to pay unless you have to take it for initial equipment. Uh, and you don't have rent to pay. So, you know, and, and you work as much or as little as you want. Uh, and another thing that we don't talk about too much also, uh, you know, not just about, you know, obviously we want, all want to make money, but what about the non-replenishable resource of time? You know, with this 
model, traveling as an in-house specialist, I can take on as many offices as I want or work in as few as I'd like. And it leaves me a lot more free time. Like for example, for me, I typically work about three and a half days a week. So I have, I have long weekends pretty much every weekend and uh, it's great. You know, I have plenty of time to spend with my family. I make excellent money doing this and I, I don't have nearly the stress or burnout that a lot of my colleagues do that have their own brick and mortar specialty offices. You know, I, I stay in touch with quite a few of them, uh, you know, for across from Florida, in Colorado, uh, Arizona, and uh, all I hear is just bickering and, and complaining about how expensive everything is and the cost of doing business. And, and uh, if they're not physically working in the offices, they're not making money, and uh, it, it's uh, stress and burnout is a real, real phenomenon. So when you beat Perry Donis that just graduated from school, um, how much student loan debt do they usually have? I mean, depending on the program that they go to, I mean, I would say, uh, along with dental school, I mean, you're talking in the vicinity of half a million, 400,000. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, if they went to private dental school, they're four hundred thousand right. dollars in debt just right, from right. The, um, the dental school. And then, I mean, right. um, Las Vegas had that article in their newspaper about an orthodontist, and by the time he set up shop, he was a million dollars in debt just for student loans. Um, so, oh when you talk about, um, do you have your own staff? Do you have do you have payroll? Do you have someone? How many staff do you have that do this with you? Go from office. I, to office? I, I, I do. I I have. Uh, basically two staff members. I, I intentionally wanted to stay small uh, in order to really remain efficient. I didn't want to get too big, even though I, I could if I want to take it in that direction. Uh, I have one treatment coordinator and I have one chairside assistant. Now, that, that can pose challenges, especially when... Say that again, you have, you have one what and one what? I have one treatment coordinator that's basically the liaison between myself and all the offices that we work out of, takes care of the scheduling logistics, and then I have one chair side surgical assistant. Yeah, that, you know, when I talk to, um, you know, the DSO captains, you know, they, they spend a lot of money trying to recruit general dentists, and, um, and it's not just DSOs, you know, Fang um, has high turnover to Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix. I mean, they, they all only keep their millennials one to two years. And that's what the DSOs are seeing. That's what private practice is seeing. It's a lot of staff turnover. But when I talk to right. a lot of dentists specifically, like, well, when did you quit and why? A lot of times it's because of the staff turnover. They'll say, you know, I had this big case and I was worried about it all night. I go in there and the first thing I learn is I have a, a, a temporary assistant who doesn't know where anything is and it's just so stressful. Um, right, so having right. your own dental assistant and then it becomes super imperative if you're doing any type of uh, conscious sedation or or that because, you know, you need to um, work well as a team for emergencies, with drugs, for, you know, your protocol. Right. So, so having um, um, always doing dentistry with the same assistant means everything. I mean, it drives oh, me insane. When I go to work and I and they give me a temporary dental assistant, I, I would pull my hair out, but neither you or I have any hair to pull out. So, <laughs> so, right. you, so you only have two staff and they're... Um, um, tra travel. Does the treatment coordinator go to the offices with you, or does she stay home and do everything remote online and just the assistant? Or yes, the coordinator co comes with me. They they follow uh, to to the offices that that I go to. Now, it doesn't really necessarily have to be that way. I mean, much of that work can be done remotely. Okay. Uh, most most of the time, what I really need the coordinator for is for the next visits, uh, or if it's a new patient consult, uh, finding the next time slot when I will be at the office, coordinating that time with the host office, uh, calling in prescriptions, uh, getting any kind of um, transportation arrangements uh, made if it is going to be a, a case that involves sedation. I mean, it gets a little more trickier that way. 
Uh, and then the, the biggest challenge I find is really with the chairside assistant. If something goes wrong and they get sick or, you know, a family emergency, that, that kind of thing. And uh, having a backup. Well, most of the offices that, that I go to have an extra floater assistant so they can fill in. But it, go, it goes back to what you said. Yes, it drives me nuts because, you know, the, these assistants that, that you work with and, and know exactly what you need in, in, in your your habits of practice uh, is huge in, in terms of, you know, delivering the results, you know, in, in the treatment in, in an uninterrupted manner to, to patients. So how much is your plan? Uh, your website, in-house dental specialist.com says with the surging corporate dentistry, private practice, general dentists are becoming more and more open to having specialists come into their office in order to be competitive, expand the services they provide and to make it more convenient for patients. And I agree becoming more patient focused instead of dental focus. I mean, um, I mean, let's be right. honest for 32 years, everyone I've ever talked to in public health says, you know, come on, you guys are open Monday through Thursday eight to five. The hospitals are open 24 hours a day. The hospitals, eight and a half percent of their emergencies are your patients from dental. Um, the dentists actually believe they're patient focused, but their, um, their, their hours, their availability, their accessibility, uh, the way right. they turn right. away, the way they have eight years of college and turn away toothaches because they can't do an extraction or get them out of pain i mean at that point you're not even a doctor um so um how much is this plan and um as you teach them about um in-house specialist has many advantages significantly less travel in your life make as much or little as you please work as much or as little as you wish significantly less overhead job security based on relationship of the referral how much is this um training consulting cost it's done more so on an individual basis because everyone everyone is prepared for this at, at a very different level, okay? I, when a specialist, for example, contacts me, you know, I, I really try to drive the point home that what you got to realize as a specialist is who is your customer? Your customer is the general dentist, okay? The patient... Uh, I mean, obviously important, that's what you treat, that's what you went to school to treat, but that's not your primary customer. And with that in mind, you know, what is it that will set you up for success? Okay, the, these are the most important things. And it's not how well you can cover the exposed root with a gingival graft, okay, or how straight of an implant you can place, okay? Uh, What's most important for success is how well you can engage in relationships and maintain and sustain these relationships. And that's what I really teach uh, or spend a good amount teaching the younger doctors because I, I find with, with the younger generation that uh, this communication skill and this dialogue that takes place is lacking between the specialists and the general dentists. And that's what I help set up uh, and teach them how, how to do. Now, do you do, um, do you do special protocol? Like, say, what are your referring doctors that you go into is uh, texting you about a patient or emailing you about a patient? Do you uh, do all the HIPAA <clears throat> protocol and all the things uh, like that for a simple text? Like, if you like, when you text me, is it HIPAA compliant? Mm -hmm. I, typically, like for for patient contact, I will not. Uh, I, I would try not to use my cell phone, okay? Uh, there are programs out there. There's a program, Easy Share Dental, that, that's coming out soon that I heard uh, that will provide a, a HIPAA-compliant uh, platform for communication between dentists. Uh, I'm actually in the process of developing an app for specialists to who want to practice in this in-house traveling mode. Uh, that will basically be kind of like your own pocket manager and it'll cover the scheduling in there, invoicing, it'll have a communication platform back and forth. If you want to do somewhat of a quote unquote, like a virtual consult, uh, you know, because that's one thing that I get actually quite frequently. Uh, I will get sent something like, 
a sentence or two about a patient and an x-ray and ask, oh, can you do this surgery? And, uh, you know, th there's got to be a way to, to do this in a very secure format, uh, protecting the patient's information uh, and, and be able to deliver service much quicker. I mean, because technology, as you know, is changing, my, my goodness, by the year. And uh, I, I feel many, many dentists are lagging in, in this regard. You mentioned dental e-share out of uh, Hunt Valley, Maryland, uh, the secure way to discuss patients' health information online, one platform, one system, one centralized database to connect, communicate, and collaborate with the referring doctors. And, and, you, and, when, and what is your app out, and what is it going to be called? Uh, ch check out, uh, I think it's called www.easysharedental.com. Easy and then my app, correct, www.easysharedental.com. And then there is another, the app that I'm creating, it's, it's still in the works. It still hasn't, uh, hasn't gone out yet. It's in, uh, it's in beta form still. Yeah, there, but the, the, uh, the, I, I will be releasing. The website was dentalshare.com. Um, there, I don't you use, use um, said easysharedental.com. That's not a website, so. So Easy Share Dental is just their website, dentalshare.com. That's what you're talking about, right? Okay. Yeah. The one that I went to a few months ago, I remember checking it was Easy Share Dental. But there, there are many. There's like uh, Bright School. I mean, there's many different forms out there of, uh, of software that, that you can use uh, to transmit. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So it's just loading really slowly. Oh. Uh, it's Easy Share Dental Communication Made Easy. That's the name of the website? Platform. That's the name of the Easy website? Share, correct. www.easysharedental. Easy, like the letters E and Z. Oh, e, okay. Easy, easy, letters easy, share, right. dental.com. Right. Easy, share, dental.com. And, uh, and do you, do you yeah. know these people? Easy, share, dental? I, I do. I, I do. I actually had a little bit of a part to play into this in, in the development of it. And I know one of the other periodonists that's uh, that, that's actively involved in uh, trying to get this to, to, to market. And, and is it, uh, is it going to be a, a big hit? Do you think? I, I hope so. We'll see. I mean, I, Honestly, I've been so busy with interest generated just from the in-house specialty training that uh, I really haven't had a whole lot of time to, to even devote to my app that I was looking at uh, creating uh, for as a pocket manager, basically for the specialists. But uh, the interest nationally, you know, with, with this model has been huge. And I, I think a lot of the dentists are scared to get started they want to but they're scared because they just don't know how or or where to start so i put together a little package uh for them that if they go to my website and just register i will send them a pdf format like a checklist as far as getting started what, what they need to uh you know think about if they want to start doing this well, yeah, um, email me the PDF and I'll, um, or, okay. or, one, or why don't, yeah, email to me or you could even post it on that uh, thread about, um, okay. that, that you're talking about. Um, let's see what else um, you were talking about. Um, you say hiring a periodontist in GP office, any do's and don'ts, um, and you post it on that thread. Um, you say, the, uh, the, the guy asks, hi, I'm a GP and planning on hiring a part-time periodontist in my practice. Do you have any tips as to how the contract works between a GP office and a specialist? I know specialists expect higher percent of collection compared to GP associates. I'm planning on having uh, this periodontist come in uh, one day a month and slowly increase the number of days to hopefully one day a week until the number of days increase and until insurance checks come in. Do you recommend doing daily minimum compensation initially that's what um, he does with his gp or to pay a percent of production rather than collection how does it work with cost of materials implant grab materials do you provide all necessary instruments should i get a lawyer involved for the contracts if so do you have any recommendations
accommodations. Sorry, a lot of questions. Please, any tips or advice will be appreciated. And those are all excellent, excellent questions and questions that I get all the time. And that's why I put together that package. Okay. And so it's it all covers, in a PDF? It's all in a PDF. That's correct. And it doesn't go into great detail, but it covers almost all of those aspects that were just asked. Okay. As far as scheduling logistics, compensation methods, marketing, liability, concerns, all of that I, I have as a package, as a checklist and for, you, for and, any And you're going to email me that to Howard at dentaltown.com? I will. And what, will if, what about my homies listen to you? Um, should they, um, do you want to give them your email address or should they go to your website? Um, in house dental specialist.com. What would be, what would be best? Preferably to go to the website okay. and to reg- register. And then when I have their contact information, I can reach out to them. Okay. Um, currently are you having, um, what, what's the interest level in your services for the big DSOs? I mean, Texas is the, um, strongest economy right now. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> are you, uh, working for the big ones? Um, does Heartland, Aspen, uh, Steve Thorne, Specific, any of these no. guys showing interest, or what? What are their? What do you think their strategy is on in-house specialists? I I have been I have been contacted by a few DSOs. I, I won't lie, I have been, but that's not where that's not where my passion and my heart is. My heart really goes out to a lot of the general dentist offices who are struggling who want to be more competitive and, and set themselves up for, for success with, with, uh, with this battle with corporate dentistry. And, uh, you know, th- those are the ones who, who are reaching out to me mostly. And uh, I, I just don't want to see, you know, private practitioners like dental offices, you know, fall by the wayside. And it doesn't have to be that way. You know, and patients, most patients don't know the difference they, they don't know that they're going to, that, that the quality of care that they will receive from a corporate entity can be very different than that from a private practice. Okay. Are, are you seeing that? Are you seeing a difference in care between corporate and private practice? I am. I am. A lot of the offices that I go to are within walking distance of, of corporate entities and I can't tell you how many I will see after the fact for complications. And then the, these patients are irritated that they have to pay twice now for treatment that they had. Like just for an example, uh, you know, implants, there are many, many different kinds of implants out there. Okay. And not all of them have the literature behind them. Like some of the big ones do such as Strawman, Nobel, and, uh, I will see complications, implant related complications quite often. And uh, I, I can't speak to what the conditions were like when the treatment was done, but I can only speak to the patient when they come in and see me, when I do all of my diagnostics and, and I can let them know what I see at that point in time. And, you know, many of them, many of them will admit that you know, we, we shouldn't have went there and, and so on. So, I mean, not to knock on, on corporate, but I mean, everything has a time and place, but you know, my, like, like I said, I, my, my heart, my heart goes out to the, the general dentists that have their own offices that really want to be more relevant and more competitive in this marketplace. That's really changing, you know, with, with, uh, with all the corporate that's popping up because there are so many, so many coming up. So what are periodontists usually, what what is their marketing advertising expense for periodontists and what percent of periodontist marketing is generated towards the B2B dentist referral versus the B2C general public uh, consumer? Well, the marketing itself, you know, for, for a periodontist to have, to have a periodontist in house, uh, it is really not that much when, when you really look at it. Periodontal disease is, is quite rampant. At least 50% of the population has some form of, of periodontal disease. And 
And as far as figuring out, okay, how do you harness that for a period on a that you'll have in-house, look at who your gatekeepers really are in the office. The majority of these gatekeepers are the dental hygienists. You know, they are the ones who see the patients two, three, four times a year, okay? They know these patients very well. The better educated they are with what to look for, they can funnel this into the period on a schedule. So from that standpoint, the marketing, it doesn't require much, you know? No, I was talking about a, a specialist who doesn't do in-house, like the the the, the opposite. Okay. Uh, so you're a, 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 a regular traditional periodontist. How much money okay. do they spend on marketing? Oh my! As a percent so, of collections. Oh, that, that's hard to say. I mean, it, it could be outlandish. I mean, it just depends on how crazy you want to get. I mean, you can spend you know, tens of thousands of dollars in order to get involved with your local television media to produce commercials. Uh, I mean, there are some that I I know, okay, in other cities that will provide golf memberships, golf club memberships to some of their, uh, you know, top referrers. I mean, that all adds up, I mean, to a lot of money, you know, like keeping up with the Joneses. And, uh, you know, this is a very simple way to practice in, in terms of reducing cost, you know, versus having your own practice. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, you could go crazy with that. I mean, I've heard, would, would I've, I've heard some, go ahead. Um, would, um, or you mentioned Strawman and no bio care. Is that what, what implant system are you, uh, if you place a hundred implants, um, uh, what, what brands would they be for? If, if I place a hundred implants, 100 or Strawman. 100 or Strawman. And why is that? I, I've exclusively used Strawman. I've had the most confidence in Strawman my, myself. Uh, I like their product. It, it's very easy to use. And pretty much all of the offices I go to uh, love Strawman as well. And uh, San Antonio t- tends to be more of a Strawman town. You know, because of UTSA. Now, so it's, uh, uh, Mar- the CEO, Marco of Strawman, um, has done a lot of mergers and acquisitions, and he bought a, a low-cost value line biodent in Brazil. Do you mm-hmm. ever use the low-cost biodent line? And if so, would you be considering that using Strawman? Or, or when you say Strawman, are you only talking about the ones from Switzerland? I'm talking the ones from Switzerland. I... I- Pretty much exclusively just use Strawman. Uh, I have not used any of their lower lower end products that that they. And that if they you and you said if your last one hundred uh, implants placed, they would be all Strawman. Of your last one hundred patients, what percent of those one hundred patients would be placing a surgical implant versus the old school traditional uh, periodontal procedures that um, used to be the norm thirty years ago? <sighs> So you're asking what percentage would be implants, implants? versus yes versus just more um, aggressive perio related perio related procedures. Well, just by looking at my schedule, I would say eighty five percent of what I do is implant or implant related. And what year it's did you uh, graduate from periodontal school? Uh, Two thousand seven. So you've had a decade, that's a uh, 2007 to 2020, uh, I know algebra and trig, uh, so uh, I should be able to figure this out. But um, the point I'm getting at, it seems like when I got out of school in 87, it was all perio procedures, you know, flaps and bone grafts and all that kind of stuff. And then everybody got the idea that the best way to treat all this is just with extractions and, and implants. But I have, I have seen this shift starting to come back in your 13 right. years. Would you say the momentum is back towards the traditional or do you still say um, most periodontists are treating perio with uh, forceps and sunshine? <laughs> so personally, I, I try to save the tooth whenever I can. Okay, that first and foremost, I am still a periodontist. So if I feel that I can get a good result or a good prognosis by, by treating the area with, with regenerative therapy, then I will definitely suggest that. Uh, yes, I am seeing many 
uh, implant related complications for, from other offices, you know, I mean, just by virtue of going to so many, I, I see many different kinds of complications and yes, they are a headache to treat, you know, and it's not an easy fix, you know, especially when you, you get these advanced peri-implantitis lesions that have completely burrowed the bone around the implant and you gotta start from scratch again after implant removal, ridge augmentation, waiting. I mean, it, 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 not only is it expensive, you know, financially for the patients, but it's also expensive, you know, time-wise as well. And what do you, um, if, if Texas, from what you've seen, most all your work's been in Texas, right? Well, well you, you practiced in Colorado for a long time, and you said you, you do some in Arizona. Are you doing anything in Arizona now? I was in Arizona for about a year, right out of school, and uh, and then I had moved to Colorado. So I was I was in Arizona for a very short period. It was it was as part of a multi specialty group practice, and uh, they had just opened up their doors. Uh, and a lot of their, a lot of their systems were not in place properly at the time. So I ended up leaving there very shortly after I started. Uh, and then I began in corporate dentistry in, in, in Denver. Which, oh, how long were you in corporate dentistry in Denver? I was there for about two years. And which, which corporate dentistry was that? There's Burmer up there. There's Comfort. It was, you know, it was part of Brunner. It was the perfect teeth. Okay. Perfect teeth. And, and how, yes, how was that correct. experience? Honestly, for me, it was not a bad experience. I, I actually had to do that as a Canadian because I'm originally from Canada. So to get my uh, permanent residency status, I did it employment based. And, uh, but they, it, for me, it was a good experience. I, I, I can't complain, you know, there, but, it wasn't, I, I knew for myself, it wasn't something that I would be able to make a career out of long-term, that, that there was an end in sight. My, my days were numbered there. And uh, it, it was just inevitable that I would follow into the private practice sector shortly after. And now you've been in Texas uh, working with so many offices. When you see implant complications, first of all, I, I know this is very hard to do, but from all your experience so far, when general dentists place a hundred implants, how many of those are going to have significant complications? That's a good question. I would say, uh, you know, it really depends on the level of training that uh, the dentist had. I mean, I, I know I'm going to get scolded for saying this, but there are some general dentists that I've worked with that, uh, that are excellent surgeons, excellent surgeons. Okay. And, uh, very cautious, very, very trained. I mean, they didn't go through a surgical residency of three years like I did. Okay. But, uh, but just very, very cognizant, very well informed and excellent with their hands. Okay. And then there are others, you know, there's a whole spectrum, you know, I'm not going to go on the other side, uh, that, that I see as well. And, uh, the, the complications that develop as a result of the ones that are not as well trained are, are where it, it really gets tricky for and it, for me when I start going into an office because I mean I need to be diplomatic, you know, with with the patient, you know, because these patients have relationships with these dentists that that uh, have provided this treatment, and. Uh, you know, it goes back to what you said, you know, with the, the jack of all trades, you know, why, why would you do that when you have the option of bringing in people who are more trained, better trained to provide these services and reduce your own liability in, in your office? Um, you know, but it's, I, I think you're always, I think you're going to always have a, some population that that's going to feel like, you know, they, they're jack of all trades. You, you said you have two employees, one's an assistant and one is a dental assistant. Um, the, the treatment coordinator, um, does she dial in remotely to the office? Like say you were 
um, going to come into an office, can she access that computer for logistics, scheduling, looking at the, um, you know, if she wants to know the schedule, does she have to call the office and talk to someone or can she dial in remotely and actually see the schedule herself? Yes. So the coordinator will work closely with the IT department to develop uh, or, or figure out which app or program they can use if we need to remotely log in. Okay, we don't do that for, for every office. Uh, most of the time we get the schedules sent to us in, in a PDF, like an encrypted format uh, the day before. We'll, we'll call and confirm patients usually one or, one or two days prior. Uh, that sort of thing. But uh, I know there was some issue with security with some of these uh, programs that would allow you to remotely log in. And I've, I've heard of some of the offices actually in San Antonio and, uh, and one in Colorado where uh, it was played by ransomware through these remote logins because uh, I guess somehow they can find out what what, you know, re these, these what remote login software are you referring to? I think it was Team Viewer, if I'm not mistaken. Team Viewer. Team Viewer. Th yes. Does your does your um, in office um, or does your treatment coordinator do, when she accepts you know a, a, an email or a fax or a printout versus being able to log in and see in real time? for last minute cancellation, all that. It, it, what is? What are some of the reasons why she likes to remote and dial in and connect to some offices and not others? Is it the software they're using? Is it like Dentrix or EagleSoft or Open Dental? Does Does she have a favorite? No, it, it's more just for convenience. To, it's only to, convenience. To bypass, it's more for convenience, right? Have you ever right. heard her mention that she likes um, dealing remotely with some office management software versus others oh yes there's a big difference between the softwares for, for sure uh open dental is a very easy one i mean D dentrix is probably the most popular one that we see uh for, for sure but D dentrix can get complicated that dentrix is pretty redundant in its systems as well but I, I see more and more of the offices that i go to switching their system over to open dental right Right, we did too, and uh, oh, Dendrix, we've tried to talk to you for thirty years, and I and, and EagleSoft, uh, they're just like your grandma and grandpa, whatever. But yeah, everyone's switching to Open Dental, and those guys don't even want right. me talking about it because they don't market, they don't advertise, and their growth right. is so right. explosive. Uh, the last thing they want is more growth. Um, so, so open dental, I mean, it's open. Um, that's, um, obvious. It, uh, I can't believe that we went over, uh, we're at an hour and eight minutes. Um, my gosh, um, oh, wow. <laughs> what, um, is there anything else that you were hoping I was going to talk about, but I didn't, uh, bring up? No, that, that's very good. You know, I mean, I just wanted to, you know, really bring, bring this out because, I find that many dentists are interested in this. There's a lot of national interest in this, but many dentists are just scared how to get started with this. Or it could be that they're afraid of pushback from their local specialists that they work with because of these relationships that they have. And in the end, you know, it is a business and it is your business. You know, and you have to do what's best for you and for your patients. And, you know, this is an excellent service to add on in your office if you want to be more uh, relevant or, or to position yourself to be more competitive in, in today's world. And um, do you do you see this, your business, um, is it growing? I mean, is it expanding is it flat is it contracting how how are you seeing in-house specialist uh growth right now it, it's growing steadily it's growing steadily uh i balance it with still working as a periodonist a few days a week and every week i get i would say just from working out of my the offices that i go to as a periodonist I, i'd say about two, 
two to four new offices contact me every week asking me to come in and work for them. And I just don't have enough time. And I, I personally, I love the educational aspect more. I love the teaching aspect more and the consulting aspect and coaching aspect. And uh, I find it very edifying and gratifying when I, when I take somebody from start to finish with, with the program and see how well they do and how they hit the ground running. But how, how much successful. is that program? You haven't given a number. How much is the program? It, it, it just depends. It's not, it's not a flat rate. Uh, I start, like for the specialists, I start at around 15000 and it's a four-month coaching program. For the general dentists, I typically, it, it, I, I'd say it averages out to somewhere between 5000 and 7500 for the program. And I will basically go in there. I will help them set up all of the systems in place that they need, depending on what kind of a specialist they want to bring in. Uh, I will discuss staff training with them, uh, scheduling logistics, uh, liability, all, all the all the different systems. I'll have that checklist that, that I'll email for you that kind of covers the framework of, of what uh, what they need to know if they want to pursue this. And do the periodont or is this program mostly just for periodontists or is it for all specialists, endodontists, oral surgeons, orthodontists? I haven't I haven't helped out any orthodontists yet. I think that gets a little complicated. Okay, I think it's doable, but there are some other modifications that need to take place in a general office, you know, just due to space and time with, with the volume of patients that an orthodontist would need to see. Uh, but it, most of my clients, I would say, are perio, oral surgery, endo, and I I had some interest from prost, but I, I think that that one can get a little difficult as well. But another big market share here too that I'm, I'm getting contacted by are general dentists who have gone through AEGD or GPR training, uh, who provide sedation services and thirds extractions who want to make a practice out of that going into offices as well. So once again, it's the dialogue that needs to take place and what they need to know in order to be efficient. And that's, I'll, I'll, I've actually helped a number of, of general dentists with this as well. And who, who do, how do you get paid? Um, who does the insurance billing? Does your treatment plan coordinator do the insurance and billing all that? Or does the office do that? Um, do you get paid when the money's collected or on on collection, or are you paid a fee of production regardless? So the insurance aspect is handled by the offices exclusively, okay? Uh, I get paid based on production, and I typically get paid the same day or the next day once the money clears from the offices because I'm not so, in network. So, you're, so when the money clears, so you're pay, being paid on collection then? It's production, collection, same day. So for example, for example, if I come into your office, okay, in Arizona, and I did an implant for $2,000, okay, and let's just say it's a 50% 50, 50 arrangement for, for number's sake, uh, you'd get invoiced for $1,000 and you'd pay me 1000 The patient will almost always pay up front before they see your, before they're taking back the $2,000. Some offices want to wait until that money clears the next day before they pay me for that. Some will pay me immediately. Some offices, I mean, just depending on the financial arrangements with, with their patients, some will only collect that portion that they will pay the specialist. So, so you're, um, so if you come into the office and do a thousand dollar implant before, um, you will get paid that thousand dollars that day. Correct. Wow. So, um, Correct. and that's that's a um, that's a amazing savings. Do you, and what percent of that one thousand would be your fee? So, okay. So let's just say the implant's two thousand dollars. Typical uh, typical fee. Uh, and we, for number six, say fifty percent. So a thousand dollars would go to me. Uh, the, the split. The from, split from is fifty fifty. Just for numbers sake, yeah. I mean, I've seen the numbers range all the way from 40 to 60, just depending on what exactly is brought in or covered 
uh, as far as materials, the staff, et cetera, you know, the, the arrangement. But for, for numbers sake here, you know, if you say 50%, you know, you would basically pay me the thousand upon rendering the services to the patient. So you're saying the fee split, would you call it a fee split or is that a legal term? You're, you're, um, but you, you'd say that, that specialists traveling in the office are usually paid 40 to 60% of production? Of production or collections. It's just, there's, there's many different ways to arrange that. Uh, there are some offices that will only do uh, collections. Uh, some are open to production. Uh, I've moved all of the ones that I go to strictly on production. It's just easier. It's cleaner to do it that way. Uh, the more you get involved with the collections, and if you are also in network with insurances, you need to have some system in place to be able to keep track of all of those payments coming in. And it can get a little hairy that way. Oh, don't say Harry when it's two bald guys talking to each other. Um, Delta is the largest dental insurance company by far. Are there any special Delta dental issues with uh, in-house specialists coming in and insurance being billed? No, no. Uh, the biggest issue I had with Delta years ago was services that I would provide would just get denied. Like, for example... You know, doing an extraction alongside a graft, you know, they would cover the extraction, but they wouldn't cover the graft, you know, or they wouldn't cover it on the same day of treatment. So in that case, what do you do? You bring the patient in at like 1158 at night, you do the extraction, and then at 1201, you do the graft. You know what I mean? I mean, it, ha it just doesn't make sense. So because of you know, th these logistical challenges with insurance, I just decided to completely stay out of network. Uh, I, I find it so much easier at, from a practice standpoint and from uh, keeping track of your numbers. It's much, much cleaner, easier, less staff needs to be dedicated to keep track of this. But what, it, but what is, when you go into an office, you go into a lot of office, what is your right. um, fee arrangement? Is, is it 50-50 is it for all of them or... Thereabouts. My, my arrangement is 60-40 that I do. Uh, I use, like I said, exclusively strong and implants. I do not use uh, different products, okay? Uh, and I get paid the same day I render services for the most part. There are some offices that require a few days for payments to process, that, that kind of thing. And, and some wait until the end of the week uh to to compensate me uh but the dentists love this arrangement the same day in production because it's just so much cleaner to do it this way and um does the office that brings you in have to be out of network or can a in-network dentist bring you in but then they just bill you separately um the insurance out of network um it's a good question. So most of the offices are in network with any number of plans. I, I would say probably up to five. Most of them are in with PPOs. Uh, there's only a handful that I go to that are, are completely fee-for-service providers uh, as the general dental office. Uh, most specialists in San Antonio are out of network and it, it's it, it's not that difficult of a sell uh, to the patients uh, for for the general dentist offices to say, hey, you know, most specialists are not in network, uh, and you have the option of either staying with our in-house provider or or going going outside somewhere else. But what, what percent of specialists in San Antonio do you think are out of network? I would say. I would say over 50%. So 50, 50. Yeah. I would say over 50. Because yes. the point I'm getting at, you charge 60% of the uh, fee for service paid at that time of, uh, um, of your work. But what is the difference in fee between an in-network uh, fee versus an out-of-network fee? 
um, generally speaking? So what I've seen other specialists do just as a comparison. So for me, my, my fee for an implant is 2200 Okay, for example, here. If I was a provider that was in network, let's just say Delta, I think Delta's fee for an implant as a specialist is like 1620. Okay. 1620. But, yes. So most providers will will start to bill for other procedures as well. So now you add the bone graft code, then add the membrane code on top of it to bring you up to around 24, 2,500. Okay. Otherwise, I mean, if you look at the cost of doing business, you know, I mean, in some other plans, like for example, I think it's, I think it's United Healthcare uh, Dental that uh, their reimbursement rate for an implant is $1,100. You know, by, by the time you take out the cost of an implant, like a Stroman implant of $500 and then the healing abutment cap, I mean, five, $600, then paying your staff, I mean, you're left with a couple hundred dollars. for What, what was the other insurance company you said? Did you say MetLife? I, or who I think it was, well, I know MetLife is pretty low as well, reimbursement for implants, but I think it's United. Okay. United Health. Okay. Yeah. They're a major player. So their, yes. their, um, their implant fee is how much? I, if I'm not mistaken, I, I saw it like two years ago. It was about 1100 yeah. So, so when you're looking at percentages, you, you want to look at the net. So if you're charging 60%, but your fee schedule, um, is, you know, from an $1,100 implant with United health feet, um, for out of network 2,200. I mean, that's, right. that's, that's, what, that's what a lot of DSOs have come to. They've, they've come to the conclusion that look, um, you can charge a higher fee. Um, the quality is higher, in that we don't have more um, complications or we don't have to do warranty redo work. Um, right, it's right. just, um, and a lot of these uh, uh, dentists have been burned so many times by, um, they provide jobs to these kids out of school <clears throat> and these kids run off and take all these classes and come experiment right, on all your right. patients. And then a uh, drop of a dime, they're off to go somewhere else and you're sitting there looking at the recalls of these implants and root canals coming in and saying, oh, my God. And then <laughs> implants is especially difficult because if you do five amazing implant cases, let's say you do five big, nice implant cases, just say they were $10,000 each, but one of them fails and you mm -hmm. have to completely eat that and redo the whole thing for free, that just mm -hmm. costs you the profits of two other ones. So now you've right. done five ten thousand dollar cases. One was a loss. The profits of two redid the other one for free. So you really only did two cases uh, and make net right. income. Do you agree with that, Mass? Or is that too simplified? It, it is sim simplified. I, one thing I want to actually clarify here is I, I see a lot of specialists also doing, or, or the general dentist doing, uh, the sedation and thirds with uh, a fifty fifty model versus the 60, 40. Okay. And I, I, one thing I wanted to clarify with that is that if you really do the math on a typical $5,000 day, okay. For production with a, a 50, 50 with materials versus a 60, 40 split where with the 60, 40, you bring in everything up your own, as far as staff, et cetera, implants, bone grafts, membrane, the difference between the two is really not that much, but it's so much cleaner and easier to keep track of just by taking 60 as opposed to, you know, 50 and then, okay, what did I use here? 50% of this, how much did that cost, et cetera, and keeping track of that. So, and that's, that's why I transitioned most of the offices to the 60, 40, just because it was just the ease, ease of it. And what software do you use for this? That's my treatment coordinator's job. But, but what software does she use? Does she use one platform or for accounting or practice management? Excel. Excel. Just Excel. Excel yeah. spreadsheets. Yeah. My gosh. Yes. Um, this has been so <laughs> fun talking to you. And I, uh, I called you, this is not a commercial. He's not advertising his services. I, I um, I wanted to bring you on and it's been, uh, um, so, uh, much, uh, fun bringing in. It's been so informative. I do think that, you know, the United States is 330 
million people so it's a big market i mean look at housing i mean it goes everywhere from right, uh right. living in a van down by the river to in a, a trailer <laughs> to an apartment to one bedroom i mean there's just many many markets but basically half of america is going to buy on cost and half are going to buy value added and the older people get the implants. A lot of them have money. A lot of them don't like going to multiple doctors. A lot of them do a lot of word of mouth referral when it's nice where, you know, I can go to one place and get everything done. Right. We, we know that in 1900, you, you know, you had to go to different stores to get your bread, your vegetables, your meat, your dry goods. And now that's right, all right. rolled into one. It's amazing going into other countries. You can go back in time. I mean, um, when I started lecturing, it'll be 30 years. This um, August 4th, 1990 was my first lecture. But I remember going the first several times I went down to Australia in the early 90s. I mean, um, you still had to go to a meat man, butcher, uh, a dry good. I mean, you, you, there was no... Uh, fries, um, big uh, conglomerate grocery stores back then. I mean, it's, it's really changing. Right. And so it'll be really fun to watch this. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for answering questions. Um, are you going to post that PDF on that thread? Or do you just want to email it to me? Or, or, or why don't you do both? Okay, I could do that, yeah. I'll, okay. I'll email it to you too. Okay. Sounds good. Well, th thank you very much for having me. It was an honor. And uh you know, congrats to you for 30 years, and uh, yeah, thank, thank you for having me. Oh, and, it was an uh, honor. Let me talk about this. All right, well, you have a great day, and drink a Corona a beer for me. <laughs> Sounds good, will do. All right, bye-bye. <laughs>